This lecture is intended for conceptual physics A, B. I'm going to show you some example problems of Copernicus's methods and also the basic use of Kepler's laws of planetary motion. The way that I normally conduct examples in class is to do the following. I cast the examples up onto my screen by using my projector. You then copy down the examples into your notes, and then I go through the solution here on the board. I do this throughout the year, beginning with this lecture here. Here's, however, how I want you to do this. What I've put for you in the folder for this lecture is I've put for you the examples that I'm actually gonna sit down now and solve. What you are to do when I prompt you is to copy down that example into your notes, and then I'll go through the solution here on the board. Of course, you'll wanna pause this lecture as we proceed. Let's take a look at the first of these examples. It has to do with Copernicus's calculations of sidereal periods. So what I have done here as I record this lecture is I've cast the problem up into my screen, which is out of the shot. Okay, it says calculate the sidereal periods of the following superior planets. The synodic period S of Jupiter is 1.09 years, and the synodic period of Mars is 2.14 years. Go ahead and copy this example into your notes now. Okay, let me go ahead and take you now through the solution here. Okay, first of all, for part A. Okay, for part A, we have the planet Jupiter, which is a superior planet. The relationship between the sidereal period P and the synodic period S for a superior planet is one of Copernicus's little formulas that I introduced in the previous lecture. That's this formula here. And then very simply, here's what we're given. The synodic period of Jupiter is 1.09 years. So for example, that's the time from one opposition to the next. We see Jupiter in opposition every 1.09 years. That's the value of S. And now very simply, all that you do is take that value of S and plug it into the expression and then just solve for P. So I'm gonna go ahead and do all the math here on my calculator in order to do so. You're gonna to wanna to double check this on your own with your own calculator. All right, so now I have here just one and then a minus one divided by 1.09 hit the equals key, and then what I have to do is take the reciprocal then of my answer to obtain the sidereal period P. When I do, the answer is in terms of years. So this is the planet's orbital period. How long does it take Jupiter, for example, to orbit the sun? So I take the reciprocal, and I end up with about 12.1 years. And so that's how long it takes Jupiter to go around the sun. Okay, then I'll also apply this method in part B of the problem. The synodic period of Mars is 2.14 years. Mars is also a superior planet. So we'll once again use the same formula as before, and the value of S is 2.14 years. Once again, just plug into the expression. So now plugging in, 1 minus 1 divided by 2.14, and then I take the reciprocal of that. And I end up then with the sidereal period P of Mars being a little bit less than two years. It's about 1.88 years, like so. Okay, so that concludes this portion of the problem. What I have to do is I also have to move the file that I have here on the screen so that I can see it, see the next problem. So let me do that. Okay, now we get to the second example, which is once again just Copernicus's calculations here, but specifically it's now for inferior planets. So go ahead and take a moment to copy down the following problem that has to do with Mercury in part A and Venus in part B. Calculate the sidereal period of P of the following inferior planets. The synodic period of Mercury is 0.32 years, and the synodic period of Venus is 1.6 years. Okay, so now this is for inferior planets here. So then therefore we use this formula as obtained by Copernicus. That's with a plus sign, as opposed to the minus sign on the board above for superior planets. Okay, now in part A, we're given that the synodic period of Mercury is 0.32 years. So this is the time, say, between inferior conjunction to the next inferior conjunction. What we now do is take 0.32, plug it into here, and then solve for P. Once again, I'll do the whole process on my calculator. So 1 plus 1 divided by 0.32. And then what I do once again is take the reciprocal at the end of the process to obtain P. And then P ends up being equal to about 0.24 years. So this is Mercury's orbital period. That's how long it takes Mercury to orbit the sun. As you can see, it's quite a short period of time. And then do the same thing here for Venus. 
This is still an inferior planet. Now for Venus, the value of S, the synodic period is 1.6 years. Once again, we just plug into the formula here and then just solve for P. So let me go ahead and do that for us. So one plus one divided by then, uh, 1.6, there we go. And then take the reciprocal at the end and I end up with P here being about 0.61 years. So that's how long it takes Venus to go around the sun. That's Venus's orbital period. Okay, let me move the file and let's get to the next series of questions. Okay, in the next series of questions, we're gonna do now Copernicus's distance calculations. That is, how far, in this case, specifically the planets Mercury and Venus are from the sun, where what we measure here from the surface of the Earth is the greatest elongation angle. We're gonna calculate then the distance in terms of astronomical units. I'm also gonna draw a diagram here to illustrate this portion, or rather this problem. This is the diagram that I drew out in notes. In lecture, that is. Okay, so specifically now recall that this is for inferior planets. All right, so here's the orbit of the Earth about the Sun. Here's the orbit of the planet about the Sun. And then right here is the Sun. And then the right triangle is constructed in the following way. Here's the Earth. Here's the planet, here's the sun, and then here's the right angle like so on my diagram. Okay, this right here is the elongation angle. That's what's given in these two problems, first for Mercury and then for Venus. Those are, by the way, the greatest elongation angles that I'm giving in this problem. Those are the actual numbers associated with these planets. Okay, and then the distance from the Earth, let me label it here as such. So the sun is one AU, and then the distance from the planet to the sun is x, the unknown. And then using a little bit of Sokotoa, a little bit of right triangle trigonometry, we use sine. The sine of theta is equal to the opposite side x divided by the hypotenuse of the triangle one. And now we solve for x. So just cross multiply the one AU to the other side of the expression. Like so, and we then end up with the following expression here. So then therefore all that we have to calculate is just the sine of the angle and that's all. Okay, so for first of all here in part A of the problem, we're doing this first for Mercury, where the elongation angle at its greatest value is only 23 degrees. Mercury is pretty close to the sun. We never see it as being very far away from the sun for that reason. Okay, so now let's just go ahead and calculate the sine of the angle. When I do, I have to be in degree mode on my calculator. So I calculate the sine of 23 degrees very simply, and this comes out to be about 0.39 AU. That's the distance that Mercury is from the Sun. And then we'll do the same thing now for Venus in part B. Venus is further from the Sun, so then therefore it has a greater, greatest elongation angle. In this case, it's 46 degrees. So now we just calculate the sine of 46 degrees, and that then gives us the distance that Venus is from the Sun. All right, so the sine of 46 degrees, that works out to be about 0.72 AU. So these examples that I've gone through thus far, these are just basic illustrations of the mathematics associated with Copernicus. Okay, and then we'll take a look at a couple of Kepler's laws of planetary motion examples as well. Let's take a look at the next example. I'm gonna to have to put it on my screen. Okay, so take a moment to copy down the next problem. It has to do with Mars as it orbits the sun. I'm gonna erase the board here to illustrate. Okay, so this problem here has to do with Kepler's first law of planetary motion. We're taking a look at some of the details of the elliptical orbit of Mars as it orbits the sun. Okay, so here is that elliptical orbit like so. We then draw, first of all, the major axis. The major axis passes through the two foci, which are here and here roughly, and then right here, the center of the diagram, the center of the ellipse. 
However, the sun is not located here. Recall that the sun is located at one focus, like so. Okay, and then we have distances. This distance right here is the semi-major axis of the orbit A, and that's given in the problem. It says that the semi-major axis is 1.52 AU. Okay, and then this distance right here is some fraction of A. This distance here is EA, where E is the eccentricity. The eccentricity of Mars is given as 0.09. Now, before I go any further, let's just go ahead and calculate what EA is. So EA is going to be 0.09 multiplied by 1.52 AU. So 9%, in other words, of 1.52 ends up being about 0.137 or so. Like so, and that's the distance EA. Okay, now we can get to part A of the problem. It says, what is Mars's perihelion distance? Now recall what perihelion means. It's the point of closest approach that the planet is to the sun. So that's this point right here on this diagram. Here's the perihelion position. So the distance then that the planet is from the sun at the perihelion position, you'll notice is the difference between A and EA. So part A of the problem is now to just simply calculate this, A minus EA, and that then gives us Mars's closest approach to the sun. So I take 1.52 and then minus 0.137. Okay, I'll round it off a little bit. It's about 1.38. Like so. And then for part B of the problem, in part B of the problem, we're taking a look at the aphelion distance. Okay, that's when the planet is over here. That's at its furthest approach from the sun, and that's this distance here. Notice that this distance here is equal to this, which is still A. That's still the semi-major axis, but now plus EA. That then gives you this distance here. So the aphelion distance is A plus EA for that reason. So I now take 1.52, and then I add to it 0.137. Once again, I'll round it off a little bit. And this comes out to be about 1.66 AU, like so. So that's how you find parts A and B of this problem. Okay, and then lastly, part C. Okay, and part C is just a simple application to continue this example of now the basic use of Kepler's third law. Kepler's third law is as follows. P squared is equal to A cubed as long as P, the sidereal period, is measured in years, and A, the semi-major axis, is measured in terms of AU. So what we're asked to calculate in part C is Mars's sidereal period P. Now we could do so because we already know what the semi-major axis is. It's 1.52 AU. So what we do is we take 1.52 cubit and then take the square root of that in order to get the sidereal period P. So I'm just plugging in for A and then just solving for P, nothing more than that. So I take 1.52, I then raise that to the third power, in other words, I'm cubing it, and then I take the square root of that. So when I take the square root, I end up with about 1.87 years. Notice that this number here matches up with the number that I calculated in one of the earlier examples when I was using Copernicus's method, okay? So that concludes these basic examples here of the mathematics associated with Copernicus and also Kepler's laws.